I'm Grandmaster Nick Purr and welcome to my Killer Endgame DVD. I'm going to start off by analysing this endgame between two Grandmasters in the 2000 Olympiad. Playing white was Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan, he's an experienced American Grandmaster. And playing black is Grandmaster Boris Gelfand from Israel. Uh, Boris Gelfand is one of the world elite Grandmasters even at the moment. So it's very important to see how he plays this endgame and how he tries to defend the ending. When we first look at the position, white has got a bishop and two pawns and black has got a knight and one pawn. So black is clearly playing for the draw and white is trying to win. If I approach this ending as black with no knowledge of how to play endgames, my first thought would be the way to try and defend the endgame would be to go after white's b4 pawn because I see that I can win that pawn and then once I've got the b4 pawn I'll try and sacrifice my knight on black's h and white's h2 pawn. However this isn't the correct way to defend the ending and I'm just going to look at some lines to show how you'd approach the ending if you had no endgame knowledge and then how you'd approach the endgame if you had the essential piece of knowledge which you need to defend this ending. And you'll see that once you've got that piece of information this endgame is actually very easy to defend for black. So let's first of all consider some options that black might play in this position if he had got no idea of how to def of endgame technique and how he might try to defend this ending. Well. My first thought here would be to go after this b4 pawn. So the most obvious move for black is to play knight to d5. By playing knight to d5, black both attacks white's b4 pawn and also threatens knight to f6 check, forking white's king and white's bishop. However, there is an immediate problem with this move and that is that white could play bishop to e4, pinning black's knight to his king. Once white has exchanged the knight for the bishop, there's no way that black will be able to both defend the b-pawn and the h-pawn. So black cannot afford for white to exchange the bishop for the knight in this position. So going back to the initial start position, how else might black try to win white's b-4-pawn? Well, another way that black might try to win the pawn is by the move knight to a6. By playing knight to a6, white can't pin the knight against the king. However, in this type of position, it's always worth trying to think about when you're the attacking player, is there any way I can get rid of black's last piece? And in this position, there is a good way that white can get rid of black's last piece. So, it's very important if you see a forcing continuation to analyse it, because it might be the best move that you can play. And in this situation, it is. White can play b5 check, which forks black's king and black's knight. Black's forced to play king takes b5. And then white can play bishop to d3 check. And there's no way that black can stop white from exchanging the bishop for the knight. So black would respond king to a5. And white would play bishop takes a6. Black would play king takes a6. Now the black king is a long way away from white's h-pawn. So black is unable to stop white from queening the h-pawn and in this position white actually has a very simple win. First he plays h4, black can respond with b5, then white can play h5, black plays b4. Both players queen now, white plays h6, black plays b3, white plays h7, black plays b2, and then white will queen black or queen and at the end of the the pawn race white actually has a winning combination here and that is to play queen to a8 check the black king is forced to move to the b file so for example king to b5 and white can play queen to b8 check the black king is forced to move again and white can win black's queen and reach a winning king against king and queen against king endgame Okay, now we're on to part three of the DVD. This is for the rating range from 1000 to 1400. The two key concepts that we're going to focus on in this chapter 
are king and pawn against king and how to give checkmate with two bishops against a king. King and pawn against king is probably the most important endgame in chess because it comes up very often. <laughs> This is the first example from the 1400 to 1800 rating category. I'm going to be looking at queen against pawn endgames. When the pawn's too far back, the queen's always going to win in a queen against pawn endgame. However, when the pawn reaches the seventh rank, the situation is very interesting. In some positions, the queen's winning against the pawn, but in other positions, the defender can get a draw using just his pawn on the seventh rank and his king. This is an example of a game I had against Feeling Master Jonathan Rogers in the 4 and CL. I'm a pawn up in this rook and pawn endgame, so it's quite difficult for him to defend. However, he found a very accurate and very good defensive technique. He played rook to a1. After rook to a1, I played pawn to g5. Black plays rook takes a3. White plays rook takes a3. Black plays king takes a3. White plays pawn to g6. Black plays king to b2. White plays pawn to g7. Black plays pawn to a3. White promotes to a queen. And now black plays pawn to a2. With the pawn on a2, black can actually get a draw in this position. In queen against pawn endgames, if the pawn's either on, on the rook's file or the bishop's file and on the seventh rank, then it's a drawn endgame. However, if the pawn's on the knight file or one of two central squares, then it's winning for the queen. Let's have a look at how black can defend this endgame. I played queen to g7 check and black played king to b1. I played queen to g6 check. I'm just trying to move my queen closer to his king side. He played king to b2. Remember, black has to threaten the queen on every move because he doesn't want to give white a spare move to move his king closer to the queening square. If white can use his king and his queen, he could win this endgame. But just with his queen, there's no way for him to make progress. And let's see why. White now plays queen to f6 check. Black plays king to b1. White plays queen to f5 check. Black plays king to b2. White plays queen to b5 check. And now black plays a key move. Black plays king to a1. He doesn't give white a chance to move his king closer to the pawn. For example, if white were to play king to e3 now, it would be stalemate. So white can't play king to e3. Instead, he has to move his queen. So I play queen to c4. Black played king to b2, and I played queen to b4 check. And yet again, black plays king to a1. So white can't move his king closer, as it would be stalemate. I played queen to c5, trying to set up a trick, because I knew that I couldn't advance my king any closer without giving stalemate. Black played king to b2, and white plays king to e2. Now black can get a queen. After black queened I played king to d2 trying to set up some checkmating traps. However queen against queen in this situation is an easy draw as long as black's careful. Black decided to defend with queen to a2. If black had played king to b3 this would have been losing because I could play queen to b5 check and after king to a3, queen to a5 check, king to b2, queen to b4 check, king to a2, and now white can win with king to c2. And black can't stop all of the checkmating threats that white has. Black also can't give white check. So even in queen against queen, you have to be very careful. However, Jonathan was aware of this, and instead of playing king to b3, he played queen to a2. After queen to a2, I played queen to b4 check, and Jonathan played queen to b3, and we agreed a draw.
You could have actually drawn it in a more amusing way with king to a1 check. And after king to c1, black has the only drawing move, queen to c4 check, forcing white to stalemate black. So with the queen against the rook's pawn, it is actually a drawn position. With the queen against the knight's pawn, it's a winning position. Let's have a quick look at queen against knight's pawn. <laughs> 